wondrous creator, we come to you this continued and blessed Easter morning. Hearts rising because Jesus is risen and we are so loved. We come to you in this sacred space, celebrating the risen one. And with the same prayer, that you once again with the words of my mouth meditations of our collective hearts simply be acceptable in your sight. Amen. All right. Some folks don't remember that it's still Easter. Or maybe they do and they just need a nap and sleep in. I feel that. Right, I feel that too, right? Lots of pastors take this Easter Sunday off. So Disciples are scared in this text, as Chris read. In Luke's version, uh, I heard Diana Butler Bass preach on it. At this is not scripted. I heard her preach on it at um, Wild Goose Festival, I think in 2019, maybe. And she empathizes with the disciples. She talks about how afraid. They must have been afraid after witnessing a murder of their friend, their brother, their loved one. And this kind of gives me goosebumps, right? To watch someone in a, I don't know, we would call it a lynching back in, you know, the 60s or the 40s or the 70s or now, we would call it a lynching. And the disciples went to the last place they felt safe. It's like going, you know, if you were a child and you went to that closet that you went to. I used to have one of those closets that I went to that I hid and I locked the door. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember my story. My grandparents finally got custody of me when I was 10 years old, and that fateful day I was locked in a bathroom, and at least I felt safe. But these 12, how should I know? How many was it? It was 11, right? Because Judas was not with them. They went to the upper room, the last place. They felt safe. They were in hiding for a few reasons, right? It was where they last felt safe with Jesus, with the Marys, with the last meal they shared with their beloved friend. And then poof, right? I don't know what would have come out of my mouth. I'm not sure it would have been peace be with you, bro. <laughs> right? It might have been what the, I don't know what the ancient or words of antiquity would have been. It would have been like, but let's talk. Let's talk about this text. And I remind you, I know Scott's the only one on Zoom right now, unless we've had some joiners. We have not. No joiners, right? That's all right. YouTube, sometimes we get some <coughs> folks that watch this. And sometimes, remember, people don't always know our scripture as well as we do. Or some of us, right? Mary and I talked about this, right? We talked about scripture and not quite getting a grasp of what this meant. Well, let's talk about scripture. Jesus is walking through walls, right? He is shape-shifting in these moments, and yet he says, touch my wounds, put your hand in my side. Well, let's talk about the lectionary a little bit. Let's remember this is the second week of Easter time, seven weeks of this. So it's Easter for seven more weeks before we go into ordinary time. And our primary guide for this season is the Gospel of John. And this is a hard one because he's heavy, right? He's intellectual. He asks us to think. 
Oh my gosh, COVID has taken my brain a little bit. And Luke is our supporting role. Luke is the one who has parties. We eat in Luke. But John asks us to think and to feel and know that there's the paraclete. Mary, we've talked about what the paraclete is. The paraclete is the Holy Spirit, the indweller, right? So Jesus is with everyone physically here, but he's preparing the disciples to understand that he's leaving and also staying. That's strange, right? He's staying by what? Leaving the Holy Spirit with him. So this week and next are stories of the risen Jesus appearing physically, but leaving. So that's, that's some odd stuff. In the following weeks, we're going to talk about faith and intimacy. Now, that's odd because the disciples are grieving. They have just watched their closest friend, their closest teacher, be murdered, right? Die on a cross unceremoniously. It wasn't pretty, right? He asked for water. He cried out to God, right? So I kind of love this intimacy. I love that he knocked on the door and in Luke, um, he asks for food, he asks for fish. He's hungry. And that's how you know that he's real in Luke. Um, here you know he's real because he asks them to touch him. So there's some real physicality happening. And I love here that there is joy happening as well. I love that there is after in the lectionary, there's seven more weeks of joy than there was wilderness in the Lent experience. I love that God kind of promises that there's more joy to come than suffering. And y'all, I know that there's no doubt that we've got suffering happening. And sometimes it can feel all encompassing. I've had a few calls this week from some folks that are really, really still suffering and really from diagnoses, uh, from COVID long, long haul COVID experiences. Not just COVID, but depression, things that happen because of isolation. Um, and then there's a glimpse, right? And we get this with Jesus happening here. We get a glimpse of the joy to come or possibility, right? And the fog that can lift and the reconciliation and resurrection or the dessert at the end of the meal, right? So a dear friend, and I think I preached on this before, and my memory kind of popped up on Facebook, posted this, right? And he, he gives us a warning. He says, it's a candid post here, but I hope you'll comment, even if you don't like it, or if I don't speak it clearly. I love all the postings of spring and feasting and family and friends. I had a lovely day myself with dear friends on a gorgeous spring day. But Easter, as a Christian holiday, I experienced it deeply depressing. I perceived my reaction as I structured into the way churches celebrate it. The rhythm of Holy Week creates a sense of foreboding, a growing darkness that ends in a day of death. As a child, I was taken to Good Friday services that started at noon and lasted for three hours. A different preacher took each day of the seven last words. We sat in a delight and sang mournful hymns. Jesus was dead. Then less than 48 hours later comes a wild moon swing. And an impossible, implausible hope. The women at the tomb realize they've seen their Lord, as do the men, much later, of course. He has risen before the condolence cards have even arrived. Before I'm even on my second box of tissues, we're supposed to celebrate life again. This is so incomprehensible that Christians have wildly adopted the pagan traditions of celebrating a fertility of life, bunnies, eggs, flowers, and food. 
Far more people show up for the spring festival than attended Friday's funeral. Because who really wants to immerse themselves in such a manic depressive episode in an American dominated culture, we, must, we most certainly don't want to face death and we do everything possible to gloss it over, pretty it up and keep it out of sight. Easter plays right into this by plugging up the broken dam of grief before it even starts flowing. Jesus didn't pass away, cross to the other side, or immediately become undead and hang from the heavens above to be with us. We just can't see him. No, he died. He died like our own loved ones, people whose lives have been intertwined with ours. He is dead. A poet expresses it so well. The marble fact, they are not coming back. The resurrection is a preposterous and useless myth, but this is not a marble fact. So I think even what Jesus misses in this text that Chris so eloquently read is that his friends are grieving. They're startled. Thomas isn't there yet when he's doubting. He's still processing what he witnessed, right? He's still processing that. He wants to feel these wounds when he's like, what are you doing hopping through? You're real and you're walking through walls. What's going on? He's grieving. He is suffering some sort of PTSD. There's even what's called confluence PTSD. They're, they're a real diagnosis, probably not in antiquity, nobody's diagnosing them with anything. And Jesus is like, come on, peace be with you, right? He's rushing them through this process. Peace be with you. Come on, Gail, peace be with you. And Jesus is rushing them through a process when they are grieving. And the trauma of what occurred, what they witnessed, those that love him. And we do this, right? Come on, time's up. Move along, right? Move on. And I get that. But he's also showing them that there's more, there's more than just their grief, right? Amidst all of the grief and loss, God has big, big dreams and bigger hopes for the disciples. He knows, Jesus knows, right, that there's more. God knows that there's more than just that trauma, right? That they're all gonna go and do other things beyond feeling traumatized, beyond grieving. Peter's gonna be the rock of the church. They're going to go have ministries of their own, right? They're gonna do other things. They're gonna have families. Bigger hopes for us than we could have imagined, right? There were things that I was gonna grow and do beyond my own childhood trauma. We are all going to go and do other things beyond these moments, beyond COVID, right? <laughs> We're not all going to be hopefully doing these things together. Sometimes reconciliation is delayed. Sometimes it's Judas couldn't see beyond that moment. It comes after departing death, 40 days of wilderness, 40 years of a wilderness experience. What does this mean? Buddhists say all life is suffering. But what you, Jesus wants us to know and what he wanted the disciples to know is that suffering isn't the end. It isn't the only thing, right? There is joy peppered in all of those experiences. What I know is after 40 years of seeking is that all things are possible with God. And a support of community and of people who believe with you, shared experiences, and a God who co creates a life with you. Friends, take time to grieve, sure, of course, right? Of course, we take time to grieve, but that's not all there is. There is hope in and amidst the grief. Give into the grief, let it consume you, let it, of course, consume you, because for a moment, that's all there is. For a time, that's all there is. But give into the hope as well. Feel your own wounds, right? And those of Jesus. Feel your own and those of your friends. 
And then lean into what is possible in that. Your art, your dreams, your possible reconciliation, and your resurrection with those that you are meant to see again at the table of grace and mercy. Because the table is big and wide and abundant. And there isn't a timestamp for what is possible. Amen.